Dr. Shafali, thank you for being here today. So excited. I'm, and I'm excited to have this one-on-one -on -one time because most people don't know this, but I discovered your work in 2017, 2016, something around that time. And I would, it was by accident because I would have never been looking for conscious parenting stuff as a non-parent, but why I wanted to have you on is because learning about your conscious parenting perspective has changed. One, I've gotten to know who I am. I've gotten to understand the complex relationship with family. And it's really just, it really impacted different areas of my life, especially relationships. So I'm very excited to share that experience and your knowledge with our listeners. Yes, I think you are my most, one of my most ardent non-parent <laughs> followers and you've been to every evolve and you're just such a part of our community. So I'm really happy to have this conversation. All right. You ready for question number one? Yes. Okay. So very briefly, just so everyone can follow along, can you tell us, can you define what is conscious parenting? Cause we'll be using that term quite a bit. Yes. It is a revolutionarily different way to parent your kids from the traditional parenting paradigm. And the way it's fundamentally different is that instead of looking at our children as these products and objects that we get to control, micromanage, curate, and create, we actually put the focus of our scrutiny, focus of our attention on how we are raising ourselves. And this slight pivot doesn't mean you don't raise your kid, but it really changes the entire dynamic because you are very mindful of how you are present, of how connected and whole you are, and all your own unmet needs and fantasies that you then do not put on your children. And if you're not mindful, then you unleash all of that and you really disregard your children's essence. So conscious parenting is the paradigm which focuses on the raising of the parents' <laughs> inner self and then the real child before them. Yes. And I think that is why so many people are resistant to conscious yeah. parenting and yeah. they're not ready to do the work usually is what that indicates to me, at least. Yes, and uh, because they have this expectation, this rigid fantasy that this is their one time to be in control. You know, mm -hmm. when we have children, we have this fantasy that finally my way will be honored and I will have authority. I will have sovereignty. I will have power. So we actually use our children to fill that need for significance mm -hmm. and power. And we don't realize that this is like a whole big deal to raise another human. And if you're tripping on wanting power, you're going to lose the game. Oof. So that brings me to a very specific part in the book that I wanted to read because it made my inner child very happy, but I'm sure it pissed off a lot of parents. So this is what you said in the book. It says, you didn't create your kids. There are two truths that you must accept. One, you didn't create your kids. They have arrived here through biological cause and effect. Having kids was not an act of selflessness. You had them to fill your own self-focused purposes. Your kids owe you nothing. Sure, they can give you respect and love, but they don't owe you anything. So I want, with that said, I want you to talk about what is the fine line then between teaching your kids how to give love and respect versus coercing them, guilting them, et cetera. <laughs> There's such a big difference. <laughs> it's so relationships, true connection and true freedom in relationships never have the words ownership, owing, obligation. That all comes from the old paradigm of fear mongering and guilt tripping, right? The, the paradigm you and I were raised in. But when you have true connection with your kid, they will want to be with you, not because they owe you something, but because in your presence, they feel seen, they feel heard, they feel respected and validated, and you are their soft spot. Who doesn't want a soft spot in their life? Who doesn't want the, a, the, the greatest cheerleader, the greatest ally? Every one of us seeks that. So if you can be that for your kid, you will get 
it in spades what you're seeking. But if you do it through ownership and obligation and control and duress, you're actually going to get the opposite of that. So I always tell parents, what do you really want? Mm -hmm. You want connection, true, free, liberated, deep, heartfelt connection. Well, you're going about it the entirely wrong way because force and control is the antithesis of deep, liberated connection. So this brings me to now let's talk about adult children because I see this. I have a lot of friends who grew up in a collectivist culture where it's there's a hierarchy, you respect your elders and oh my God, the ones that come from immigrant parents, they have this feeling of guilt that their parents have this narrative, I sacrificed so much for you and how do they separate or how do they navigate maybe is a better word that adult relationship with their parents who are still kind of hovering that narrative of you owe me. Yeah, you you can allow that narrative to exist within their psyche, but you have to just contextualize it as coming from that traditional background and not buy into it. You know, you have to be really strong to not be guilt tripped just because someone wants to guilt trip you. And that's where your own boundaries come into play. It's very hard. I'm sounding like you're making it sound like, oh, it's just don't do it. But I know how hard it is because I come from that culture. And, um, you know, I actually have parents who don't guilt trip me, but I see my friends being guilt tripped. And I'm so grateful to my parents who never make me even worried about their birthdays or Mother's Day or Father's Day. It's irrelevant to us because of our deep connection. So we have to understand that our parents come from different times and culture, and they will try to guilt trip us, but we have to allow them to do what they need to do for their psyche, but we don't have to feed it. And it's hard, but we have to give ourselves the pass to not feel obligated because obligation sucks and doing yeah. things out of obligation never feels good and eventually we will resent our parents which most of us do and then we flip out so mm -hmm. we need to create healthy boundaries you know so if your mother says i can't believe you haven't called me you don't love me anymore <laughs> you don't care you just have to let it pass by clouds in the sky and mm -hmm. say yes mom i understand i understand and okay. not even not even stroke it, don't give it any energy. Just allow your parents to be in their traditional paradigm and kind of move on. So just not taking it personally is really what it sounds like. And with compassion, understanding that they are old school and they're coming, they were guilted <laughs> by their parents. Guilt is their language of love, you know. Ah, yeah, you're right. That's a good way to think about it. That's how they show love. Right. So look, their... when, you, when your mom says, I can't believe you didn't do X, Y, Z, if we are not healed we will take it very personally. But if we're healed, we can say, I know you miss me. I know you just love me. I know that you're hurting. I understand, right? You become your parent's parent in a way. Mm -hmm. It's not your job, but when you have perspective and you've healed yourself, then you can see the inner child in your parents and release them from this desire you have that they're going to be adults because they're not. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. And no, I mean, you said that perfectly. So while you were speaking, I thought about how people who do adopt the older paradigm of parenting. I remember hearing this argument multiple times, and I'm sure you've heard it a million times when people say, okay, I hear you, Dr. Shafali, all this conscious parenting, but they say, but kids need structure. Kids need to know that there should be a higher in place, that I am the authority as the parent. And even, I find that these people often also believe that your kids should fear you a little yes. bit. So I'm, I'm curious to what do you say to people who have that resistance to conscious parenting? Right. They have an automatic knee-jerk resistance because they are so seeking control mm -hmm. and to give up control feels anathema to them. And they're terrified of that. That's where they're coming from. They're not really resisting it because they haven't even tried it. So mm -hmm. you can't resist something you don't even know, right? Truly, yeah. you're just yeah. arguing because you don't want to give up control. Yeah. This is not a model without structure. It's plenty of structure, but it's sensible structure. It's not rule upon rule upon rule upon rule. It's, mm -hmm. it's really allowing children to be children 
and trusting them to know who they are, but providing the ultimate structure. So, you know, you can provide structure as in go to school, do your homework, brush your teeth, eat some food, go to bed, like, or brush, or maybe have a shower, right? Four or five Mm -hmm. things. But we've overburdened our children's schedules with so many rules and regulations. Put your backpack here. First have this snack, then go there, then go to violin, then go to ballet. And so obviously we overburden our children and then we're running into all sorts of fights. So if you remove the extra extraneous burdens on our children and and really keep to the basics or what they really enjoy so then you're not in resistance then we've lightened our load and we follow a structure but the structure doesn't have to be dogmatic you cannot with children you cannot say i expect to have dinner by 7 15 and by 7 45 we are in bed you're going to set yourself up for failure it's like having Mm -hmm. a puppy you know you have to understand that children need lots of space and time to unravel to transition. Most children have a hard time transitioning. And here we are like drill sergeants, expecting them to be mini adults. They are not mini adults. Children have their own psychology. And in this book, The Parenting Map, um, this book, I really lay out how we as parents can understand our children so that we can create flow rather than create resistance. I see parent after parent creating resistance rather than flow. And I Mm -hmm. teach in this book how you can create flow. And when you're in flow, children cooperate with you. But you have to create the conditions for flow. But most of us are creating the conditions for resistance. Yes. And I think that is a huge thing that is missed, is the understanding between that. And I think there's a fear, like you said, of letting go, letting the flow go. There's this fear of, well, will I have control? Will I be able to control the flow? <laughs> so it's really interesting. But I love that you give, there is still a structure. There's, there's, a, there's a shell. And within shell, the shell, you, you need to have plenty of freedom. And actually, I felt the most in control when I gave up my need for control. Hmm. Because then I was more present. When I was more present, I was more attuned. When I was more attuned, I had more influence because my kid felt connected. And then together, we could partner in creating the the flow and the energy of the home. But when it was left all to me, then I became rigid. I lost creativity. I lost my energy. And I was looking at my child as a me versus you. And this book, The Parenting Map, helps parents understand how important it is not to set up a me versus you dynamic and to actually get to your child's side and become their partner. Because when you do, you give the child the freedom or the perception of freedom, and then you got a willing partner. But you if do, you, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. But if you spit yourself up as the leader and they are the follower, now you are working against your child's natural desire for autonomy and you're creating an enemy and you're going to you're going to suffer so you don't want to even put yourself in that dynamic you see that's why conscious parenting is so different because you cannot understand it from the same framework of traditional parenting you have to really mm-hmm. let go everything you knew and that's why i wrote this book step by step the 20 steps in this book because it's a journey this book was laid out as a journey the stage uh, that it starts with is stage one, where you let go of your dysfunctional mind belief systems and your mindset. Stage two is where you let go of your dysfunctional patterns. Mm -hmm. And stage three is where you learn to connect. So if you read this book like a journey and say, you know what, I'm going to spend the next 30 days getting into this book and do all the practice exercises, make my notes, journal every day, Trust me, the parent at the end of 30 days will be a transformed human being with an entirely new paradigm of Mm -hmm. philosophy. This is a philosophy. It's not a strategy. And I love the way you organized the book. Like you give it the conceptual of the teachings and then you say, okay, now go do this. (laughs) The application part, which I think people have been you know, bugging you for since the awakened family. Okay, Dr. Shafali, but how, but how, but how? And you really do that in this book, which is not easy to do. And that a lot of authors don't do that. So I thought it was incredible that you literally said, this is how you apply it. Now go do it. (laughs) It's very, very hard because every child is different. I, I cannot 
address every complexity, but I've given a roadmap now. If you do this work that's in this book, especially stage two, because stage two really breaks down your patterns. And I identify different kinds of patterns that parents typically take on. If you get stage two good, you're going to be a transformed golden human being in all your relationships. So, yes. I mean, I've really distilled it down, but parents have to take it seriously mm-hmm. and be devoted to this method. And then you will reap the rewards. You cannot do this willy nilly. Uh, and you have to truly be invested in the teachings and you will bear the fruits of the reward. I love what you said right there is that it's not just, they're not only going to see a difference in their parent child relationship, but they're going to see it in all their relationships. And that's what I found to be true for me because never in a million years would I think I pick up, why would I pick up a parenting book if I'm not a parent? Like it, in my mind, it didn't make sense. But when I was listening to you speak so many years ago, I was like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. And it helped me personally reparent myself. Mm, And I'm curious to know for people who are not parents or, but were maybe, you know, maybe people who, or even if they are, it doesn't matter if they had unconscious parents or were parentified as a child, how do you think this book or any of your teachings really helps them heal those inner child wounds that they may not even know they have. Right. And that's why you come into stage two of this book thinking that you don't have all these wounds, but I show you how those wounds were created and the patterns that you then used to offset those wounds. But the beautiful thing is that you then begin to understand your parents and your spouse better or your partner better. And then you begin to see the same patterns in your children. And then you begin to understand them better. So this is really about healing generations of pain and understanding your childhood so clearly and and having compassion for all you have been and all you haven't been. So this is really about deep healing work. And then stage three, once you've done all this work, now you're ready to absorb real-time strategies to implement in your relationship with your kid. You can't connect with your kid if you haven't done stage one and stage two. I mean, this is what I do with clients. This is what I teach in my coaching institute. And it's all in one book now. So every lay person out there can pick it up, do the work, and at the end of their journey, will begin to implement such incredible strategies with their children. I mean, you will they will not believe it. People who've read the ebook have told me, you know, I've been sending it out for review, how it's transforming them just while while reading it in real time. Yeah. And that's how I felt when I was going through it. I know so much of your teachings, but to see the way it was broken down, so just cons- very precise, that yes. I think is what is going to resonate with people. And there yes. was actually a part in, I can't remember what section it was, but you say that the goal of conscious parenting is to become irrelevant to your yes. kid. Right. And I'm sure that word is going to hit some people like a ton of bricks. But right. yes, right. I tell, what, does, I what do you this, mean by that? Right. I tell the story. My daughter actually told me and my uh, her father, um, you know, I don't even know. And she was only 12. I don't know why I'm even bothering with you two, something like that. <laughs> you all are irrelevant. Your, your opinion is irrelevant. And um, the SAT buff in me was so proud of her using <laughs> such a big word. <laughs> But, and then I was like, but I should be upset. Like, she's so rude. She's so disrespectful. But then I thought about it more and I realized, wow, she just actually released me from being a parent anymore because that is the goal. The goal of parenting is ultimately to release your children into their own trust of their own sovereignty and their knowing. And I raised my daughter like that and she's not unwise. I'm not saying she's fully wise, but she's not (laughs) terribly a fool. I mean, she's pretty amazing given that I really let her inculcate her own knowing and finding her own truth. And she stands strong in that inner knowing, which I'm so proud of. Um, So it works. But yes, we're so afraid of being irrelevant. You know why? Because we gain our sense of identity and significance from when they need us. You know, I'm the first to admit that when my kid needs me, 
oh my god i love it i love it i love my ego loves it right oh yeah. Lord, she loves me oh she wants my opinion it's oh. so sick right because what are we really saying please need me please yeah. depend on me please don't know what to do and look at me as the answer that's not okay that's something twisted right so <laughs> i see that part in me and it's very rare that she does use me for that but i do see my ego going oh thank you thank you for giving me some purpose some identity yeah. some significance but that's where we get twisted is because we identify with the with the need we want to be needed and therefore we enmesh ourselves with our children and we don't fly free you know we don't let them or ourselves fly free the truth is you know by 14 15 they should be practicing a lot of autonomy and decision making but we don't release them that's why teenagers and adults fight because there's so much of who knows best and we presume that we know better and of course we logically know better <laughs> but that's not the point of this this is not about who's more logical this mm-hmm. is about teaching our children to practice the skills where they get to know who they are and if we don't let them practice then when they go to college they they're just out of control which is what typically happens yes and i think that's the you want them to be able to practice that discernment of critical thinking and deciding what what's best for me right now and being able to do that and if you're always doing it for them what kind of adult are they going to be yes it's it's very tricky because we parents are terrified of the outcome right we're always mm-hmm. fixated on the future so we we are constantly living in the future but in doing that we are missing the opportunity that the present provides if they fail with us that's an amazing opportunity but we are so afraid of them failing in the future that we don't let them fail in the present so then they never have that scaffolding so then they fail in college or they fail as an adult and then they don't have that buttress or they don't have that teaching or that help better they fail with us than later but we don't give them the permission now i'm not talking about drinking alcohol with the 12 year old right this is this is not about that kind of failure this is about allowing your children to have organic life experiences as it shows up and sometimes it may be having to do with alcohol but you don't have to give them the alcohol if mm-hmm. they test themselves with alcohol with their friends and they quote unquote fail wow what an amazing opportunity you have now to show them the cause and effect of alcohol in their system yes exactly i mean wonderfully said so i that brings me to i guess it brings me to this this last point that i have one more question and then we have a rapid fire series of questions so this everything you're saying again i'm not a parent but i am, i am an aunt i'm a mentor i am a teacher yeah. Yeah. and these things are still so transferable i was curious to know that you you wrote the awaken family quite a while ago and you were teaching people how to have more conscious families because your teachings transfer so much to educators and people who work with young children i was curious if you've ever thought about doing something to create more conscious classrooms and conscious teachers because so much of your teachings transfer over so I was just curious if you ever thought about that oh all the time you know i have so many so many times thought about writing the book the conscious teacher but mm-hmm. i think the principles are literally identical uh of course you have less influence over the student's life than you are mm-hmm. a parent but it's really the same thing because as a teacher you are in many ways a surrogate parent Uh, for that little moment in time and so you have to see see the child as a unique essence understand that they're trying they're learning and i think teachers make way better parents you know because they get it they see, because they they see the unique diversity of children so yes. they don't pigeonhole children as much as a parent would right parents don't have the experience of many children so mm-hmm. we pigeonhole our children based on our expectations teachers know it's so stupid to have expectations because every day is going to be a new day with with 30 children in the classroom so they have a much more nuanced and complex understanding of children i think i i always say teachers make fabulous parents uh grandparents make better parents parents make the worst parents right so it's just it's so sick and twisted how the universe has has made that dynamic up where yeah. 
it's just that's the way well, it is. Because the parent is just too invested in their own ego here yeah. and their own image. So the minute you're invested with your own ego, your own emotions, your own expectations, now the the water is muddied, and you're not truly giving the child the the tools they need to develop. You're messing it up because of your own bullshit coming into play. So that's always interfering, right? Yep. Teachers don't have that. Grandparents also don't have that. They, they're not so invested. Their ego is not so wrapped up and twisted. But parents, oh my goodness. So that's what messes us up. Wow. Well, things are not looking hopeful. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're right. You're right. And you know, well, so what we're going to do now is I have a series of just rapid fire questions. Just answer whatever comes to mind and we'll, we'll see where this takes us. Great. Okay. okay. All right. So first one is in a perfect world that will never exist where people would have to get a license or a certification to become a parent, what courses or requirements would you have them take? I mean, I'm, I'm going to send them for uh, meditation courses for at least 30 days minimum once a year. That'll be a renewing to renew your parenting. Oh, I like that. Yes. So maybe the first time 30 days and then maybe five days every year. That's okay. a requirement. Another requirement is that there <laughs> should be free coaching available if or subsidized coaching for parents. So they have to see a coach at least once every two weeks to stay sane. And then they must uh, read all my books. <laughs> and, I mean, and, really, yes. That's yes. the textbook. <laughs> yes. And all you know, all other educators books, you know, your work, uh, all the, the renowned experts in the field of psychology, mm -hmm. they need to get a psychology degree, basically, in, in particularly yeah. child psychology. Yeah. And this would be a mandatory requirement. Oh, I wish. I wish. It'd be amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Next one. What is a common misconception saying or myth about parenting you wish would just end for good? Um, that parents should raise happy, successful children. Ooh. If we could just get rid of that, a lot of our yelling and screaming would go away and our children would relax. All this running for one competition to the other and one tutor to the other would go away. So children had more space to relax and enjoy and truly have a childhood. Mm, yes, I like it. What is one area of your life that could use more mindfulness? Oh, hmm. I know I'm acting like I'm so perfect. I can't find the area. <laughs> no, it's not that I'm so perfect. I'm like, there's so many. I don't know which one should be the one. Well, you know, my parenting is kind of on, on auto because my kid is 20. Uh, um, okay. I would say, oh, I would say better boundaries in terms of, um, assertiveness and saying no more I tend to really mindlessly say yes a lot and get into a lot of trouble Ooh, fun <laughs> okay perfect what is one lesson you had to learn before you could ever write the parenting map that the the parenting map this book really took the life out of me because I was so resistant to giving the how-to but once I began writing it, I realized I do know how to give the how to. So I think for me, it was a lesson of trusting my own wisdom and allowing parents to, to trust their wisdom. I was almost resistant uh, yeah. because I thought if I gave the how to, then it would lose the beauty of the complexity. But I managed to keep the beauty of the complexity while also making it very simple. So I think it was about trusting myself. This one took a lot out of me to trust that I could do this. This this was not easy to do. And you did a great job of keeping the complexity. So well done. And I think we need to put it into, you know, the when people have children at the hospital and they send you home with some stuff, I think the yes. book needs to be put in there I think so. when you send them home. And then the last question I will say is when you are no longer here, on this earth, what do you hope conscious parenting has given your daughter? Oh, just a great sense of humor, empowerment, the understanding that life is to be lived in the moment, 
life is impermanent and to really, you know, just live every moment with her fullest being and her fullest presence uh, and not to be wallowing her time away in misery or resentment or sadness or really to live this life. And I wish it for every human being, including myself, with full presence and embodied joy. Thank you, Dr. Shafali. Thank you.